this Lord's Day. We come before you as the awesome and almighty God, the sovereign of the universe, one who is over and above all things and holds all things in the palm of his hand. And we come, Lord, as those who have been rebellious and those for whom you died to redeem. Lord, in there is a mystery, one that we scarcely can fully comprehend, but one which we embrace by simple faith that you love us. And God, in, in result of that, we humble ourselves before you in praise to give you the glory that is due to your name and to beseech you, God, that you would come in the fullness of that glory. And God, that you would walk among us that you would fill us with yourself. And God, that you would renew our hearts and our minds. In Christ Jesus, whose name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I uh, do want to say I had a very nice uh, time. I uh, went to uh, down near Dallas, Texas, spent... Uh, several days with uh, my daughter and her family there uh, had a had a very nice time. It's a lot of driving, but uh, it's, it's it was a beautiful ride for the most part. Uh, and so um, I appreciate the time away. All righty, who has? Um, let's see. Uh, is this for today? Okay, yeah. Here is our our verse for today. This is out of Romans chapter 8, verse 31, and it is the last half of the verse. So, let's say this together. If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. And just so you will know, the assumption is, the answer is no one. No one can be against us successfully because God is for us. Let's do it again. If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31b. One more time. If God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31b. Very good. Uh, in the prayer a moment ago, I spoke uh, just a little bit of mystery. There are, in Scripture, mysteries. Uh, the Bible is a revelation. In other words, God is revealing something to us. He is revealing himself. He is revealing truth. He is revealing truth about us and about the creation, uh, as well as about things to come. In doing so, particularly when God is talking about himself, there are mysteries involved. And even though God reveals himself to us, he does so not out of his limitation, but out of ours. We are finite. We are limited we are in God's image, but we are quite different than God. God is eternal. God is a whole host of things. God is all-powerful. We call that uh, his omnipotence. Uh, God exists everywhere all at once. We refer to that as his omniscience. Um, God fills the universe uh, he is all-powerful. And so there are a lot of things about God that he reveals to us, but the truth of the matter is we do not have the capacity to fathom everything about God because we are finite. God is eternal. God is boundless. God is love, uh, but God is also just. <laughs> 
God is absolutely perfect in every aspect of his being. We refer to these as God's attributes. And so he is infinite in all of his attributes. He reveals to us that he is one God who exists in three persons. We refer to that as the Trinity. Most of you, are, I assume, are, are aware of that. Uh, if you've given it much thought, you're also are aware that my capacity to understand the nature of God is limited. And because of that, I liken it to this. Um, when you say, uh, how many of you have seen the ocean? Okay, I'm assuming that there's a fair, where we live, I'm assuming there's a high number of you that have seen the ocean. Well, have you really seen the ocean? Or did you see a portion of it? How much of it did you see from where you were standing? Did you see from pole to pole? Well, no, you didn't because we can't do that. Did you see from shore to shore? Well, unless you were looking at New Jersey, the answer would be no. You were not looking at Paris, Spain, or England, or one of the other European countries. We can't see that far. So you were looking at a limited portion of the ocean. How deeply did you look? You didn't look to the depth of the trenches that are out there, so what you saw was the surface. So when you say, I've seen the ocean, what you're actually saying is, I've seen a microscopic portion of the ocean. You didn't see all the life that lives in it and swims and teams in it. When we are talking about God, what I know of God is similar to that. God has revealed himself to us. But my capacity to fathom the fullness of God is severely compromised. And so what he reveals about the Trinity is that he does exist in persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Holy Ghost, same term. Can I fathom that? Can I figure that out and plumb the depths of it? No, I can't. But God is giving me a snapshot of himself, not an MRI. Does that make sense to you? Because God often, in revealing himself, his nature, and his works, is revealing the infinite God to a finite mind, there are many times, in fact, almost every one of God's attributes will cause me at some point to say, I'm in over my head, I can't understand it all. And one of the great mysteries of Scripture has to do with God's sovereignty and his work of redemption. And it has to do with the concept of free will and predestination. Now, we're going to look at this today. And what I would like to ask you to do is, first of all, as we, we're going to read a couple of passages of Scripture, I'm going to, after we read those, I'm going to look at the words that are used and try to come up with a definition of those words. I believe Kayla did have some definitions. I have asked her to put them on PowerPoint, but I also asked her, to, I, well, she also said, yes, she has these words written down. <laughs> And so I want to look at them. I want to look at what they mean. I want to look at how they fit into the context and some of the practical applications of that. So our text today comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. How many of you are familiar with Romans 8, 28? And we know that all, in all things, God works all things together for good of those that love him who are called according to his purpose. Okay, this, this says that God is sovereignly causing all things to accomplish his purpose and that that purpose is for the good of those who are called by him. That would be us. So in Romans 29, the next two verses... He says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. 
to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Let's ask God to bless his word and to bless us with understanding of it. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We also thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit, who is able and willing to give us insight into the understanding of how to interpret your word. Lord, we acknowledge our limitations, but we also acknowledge that you are not limited and that you are able to help us understand. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's look at a couple of words here. First of all, the word for knowledge. What does that mean? What does it mean scripturally? Well, the word for knowledge here means not only to be aware of, but also to know in the relational sense. All right? To foreknow means more than just God knows what's going to happen. It is not a passive knowledge. It is an active knowledge. In other words, God is an actor. He is acting on something. When it says that he foreknows, it means to know in a relational sense. To know in Scripture often means to be in an intimate relationship, such as when the Bible says that Adam knew his wife, and the result of that knowledge was the birth of a child. So this is more than just, hi, Eve, how are you? Oh, I know you. Now, this was the act of consummation. For Adam to know his wife meant that he was in an intimate relationship with her. And in Scripture, this word foreknowledge means that in the spiritual sense, that God knows beforehand those that belong to him. We are in a relationship with him. God foreknows his own in a spiritual relationship of oneness with himself. Simply put, God is the acting agent in foreknowledge, not a passive observer. He knows because he acts, and it is not that he acts because of what he sees. That becomes clear in the next phrase in the text. So, the term foreknowledge means that God is actively in a relationship. Let's look at the next definition. The next definition is the word predestination, and that means to determine beforehand. God decrees in his sovereign authority what will be. Specifically here, it refers to God ordaining the salvation of those who will be glorified. Let me read that again. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. The next term is to be called. Now, the term called has a, a fairly broad range of meaning but it includes these things. The universal call. The Bible says that there is a universal call to all humanity. This is the call that every person is exposed to in creation. Uh, the psalmist says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and that it does so in every speech and language. It's talking about how God, I like to use the term, God has put his fingerprints on the creation. 
And it only is a fool who looks at the creation and doesn't at least see that the creator exists. In fact, scripture says that because of the evidence of God in creation, <laughs> that we have enough to where we should honor and glorify him as God. That is a universal call that goes out, and it is, it is painfully obvious. It's like looking at the Mona Lisa and realizing, hey, somebody painted that. And the creation is more glorious than any human work of art. If you've had opportunity to, to do any traveling, if you've had opportunity to see any of the glorious things that God's made, it's pretty obvious. Even the ocean itself, or the mountains, or the sky, or the stars, and the depth of the universe that's visible to us. And, and the knowledge now that it is so much more vast than what we're able to see. And so that is the universal call. It is a passive call. In other words, God is active. And when I say it is passive, I mean in the sense of God puts it out there as an open invitation to all. Secondly is what I would, I've referred to as a general call. All men are commanded to repent of sin and turn to Christ through the gospel. This also is an invitation. It is a passive call. So God has revealed himself in creation. He has revealed himself in scripture. He has revealed himself in the person of Christ. He has revealed himself through the prophets. He has revealed himself through his presence in his church. And so God has made his presence known. And that also is an invitation to all who hear. And then, thirdly, the term called refers to a different kind of call, which is what we call an effectual call. This call is not passive. The first two calls are an open invitation. This call is a command. When Jesus stood in the boat and spoke to the water, it was not an invitation, it was a command. He said, peace, be still. And when he said that, the waters calmed because he is God. The effectual call is not passive. It is a decree of God that is personal and entirely an act of grace. Unlike the passive call, it is a command to live. The Bible says that we are dead in trespasses and sin. Jesus referred to salvation as being born again, not physically, but spiritually, because we are born spiritually disconnected from God as a result of the fall of Adam. And when God gives this effectual call, a great example of this is the conversion of Saul. Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians. His effectual call involved him ending up off of a horse. I kind of get the feeling that that was not altogether his idea. It involved God calling him by name, and he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul's response was, well, who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus Christ, whom you are persecuting. And that was Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. The effectual call of God is when God calls you with intent. And he calls you to live. That which was dead before is born spiritually and is brought to life by the creator. And he puts to death that which was and raises to new life that which now is. That's what called means here. Let's look at the next term, 
to be justified. Now, at times, a rather casual explanation of this is to be made just as if I'd never sinned. But actually, that's a less than complete definition. It is to be declared righteous. It is where God takes something that is not and declares it to be. When Jesus turned water into wine, he didn't have a pack of instant starter that he could put into the water. He simply commanded that water would be transformed into wine. And so when God declares us to be righteous, he does so as a divine command. That which was not righteous is made righteous by a command of God, by a supernatural act. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that no one is righteous on their own. The first three chapters of Romans lays out a very unflattering picture of what God sees in you and me before we're saved. And then God declares us to be righteous. The only one who is righteous is Jesus Christ. And true righteousness must come from God. It's not going to come out of us. It, the Bible says it won't come out of religion. It won't come out of morality. It won't come out of any of the things that we can do. It only comes when God decrees righteousness to be our portion. And what he does is God decrees that the righteousness of Christ for account. Standing before God as a judge, we're all standing there guilty. That's what Romans tells us. We're all standing there with a with a with plenty of evidence to our guilt. And because of what Jesus Christ has done, those who are in Christ are given his righteousness in the same sense that he took your sin. He owned that sin and wore it before God as a, like you would wear a garment. Jesus wore your account before God. And God, it says, emptied his anger at our sin onto Jesus. That's how he died. And in exchange for him wearing my guilt and yours before God in judgment, he in turn allows me to wear his righteousness when I stand before God. Romans says there is therefore now a righteousness that comes from God. And it's the only real righteousness that there is. It is specifically why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me because nobody else has that gift of righteousness to bestow on you. So when you stand before God, you're not standing in your good works. You're not standing in anything you've ever done. Your justification depends on what Jesus Christ did. And the fact that he allows you to stand before God robed in that righteousness. And when God sees the righteousness of Christ, he declares us to be righteous to be justified before God. That's what it means to be justified. And our last definition is to be glorified. What does that mean? That means to be restored to the unblemished image of God, made holy and perfect. That's the only ones that get into God's heaven. If God were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? The only answer that gets you through the door is I have been made glorified by the righteousness of Christ. I have been made right. I have been recreated in the image of God. I have been restored to 
to my unblemished image as an unblemished image bearer of God. And I have been made holy and perfect. When God made everything, at the end of each day, he would say, that's good. That's good. But after the fall, it wasn't good. And none of us are. To be made, to be glorified, We use the term in glory, referring to heaven, the place where only the glorified, only the perfect, only those without blemish can dwell. No sin makes it through the gates. None. That's what these terms mean. Now, let's talk a little bit about the meaning, the plain meaning. <laughs> The progression of thought is, and I'm just going to go backwards. To get into heaven, you must be glorified. To be glorified, you must be justified. To be justified, you must be called. To be called, you must be predestined. To be predestined, you must be uh, foreknown by God. From God's perspective, Salvation is what he does from start to finish, not what we do. The biggest stumbling block that keeps an awful lot of people out of heaven is their belief that somehow they have to measure up. And it is when I confess to God that I don't and I never will unless he does it, that is when I actually am open to this work of God. Jesus said to the Pharisees, when he opened the eyes of the blind, they said, oh, they said, oh, do you think we're blind? Because he was preaching and, and they couldn't understand it. And they said, do you think we're blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty. But if you would admit you're blind, you would be given sight. What does that mean? That means when I admit to God I'm broken, that's where I have to start by acknowledging to God I'm broken beyond human repair. And until I can confess that to God, I will never be healed. I will never be made right. Salvation is when I'm made right by the Creator as an act of creation. And so, that's why it says that salvation is the work of God from start to finish. It is not what we do. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, lest any should boast. What's the practical meaning of this? This makes salvation due entirely, entirely to the grace of God. It isn't that God does 90% and I have 10%, or that God does 95 or 98 or 99 or 99.9%. .9%. It is that God does 100% of the work of conversion. And it also says that God does not make his decision based on what we will eventually do. Rather, we believe because of what God did and because of his choice of us. This leaves no room for boasting. There is no way that I can look at another person and I may be tempted to look down on that person. I may consider that person to be unrighteous, unworthy. I have no right to look down on that person because of my faith, because my faith was a gift, not a virtue. It's what God did. When you start understanding this, you realize what grace really is. It is absolutely unmerited unmerited favor. There is nothing that I did. 
in the past, nothing that I will ever do in the future that merits what God did for me. It was an act of sovereign grace. I made the right choice because God chose to give me life. Why does this matter? Why does God want you to understand this? Why does he put this in Scripture? So, Because in doing so, he's saying, I want you to understand this. The question of God's sovereignty matters because, first of all, God's word declares it. And therefore, he wants you to know it's important to God for you to understand. It is also consistent with other scriptures that teach that God is indeed sovereign. It also makes our salvation secure. Because if you did it, you could lose it. But God did it. And God is the one who says, when I do it, it's good. And it's done right. And he says that because he did it, that no one can pluck you out of his hand. You understand the difference? If I did it, if it had my fingerprints on it, who would get the glory? Me. But I don't have a fingerprint one on it. And it's all the work of God. And therefore, who gets the glory? God gets the glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. The question of God's sovereignty and free will of man is complex, to say the least. Many allow emotion and human reason to be their ultimate guide, rather than the word of God. I was watching one time, and a lot of folks would disagree with this. A lot of folks uh, are, are greatly opposed to the teaching of predestination. It's right there in Scripture. Now, you can either accept it or you can deny it, but it's right there. What are you going to do with it? Sometimes folks try to redefine it. That's not how we understand Scripture. Scripture is God's word, but he puts it in human language, and he chose the words intentionally and with great care. I was watching one time a uh, particular preacher. I'm not going to call his name, but you would know the name if I called it. And he was teaching on this concept of predestination, and he didn't like it. But here's the problem. I watched him as he put his argument together. And as he put his argument together, he was talking about God's omnipotence and <clears throat> the fact that God knows all things. <clears throat> and he made this statement. <clears throat> he said, because God knows everything, before God created the world, God already knew who was going to be saved and who was not going to be saved. And that's what he called foreknowledge. Now, that's a very incomplete understanding of foreknowledge because it, it completely neglects the relationship that is inherent in that term. He defined foreknowledge as only what God knows, not about what God does. And that doesn't work, and I'll, I can explain that in a minute. Because he says, whom God foreknows, he also justified. So if, if that's only about what God knows, then everyone he knows would have to be justified. For whom God foreknows, he also justified and he also glorified. That, by its very definition, is universalism, which means nobody will be lost. By virtue of God's foreknowledge. It cannot mean that. Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. He came into the world so that heaven would be an option rather than hell. Universalism is contrary to everything the Bible teaches. So this guy, he says that 
He says, if God knows where you're going before you're born, by virtue of the fact that he allows the lost to be born, then predestination has to be true. Now, I'll be honest with you, that's a fairly logical argument. If God knows where you're going to spend eternity before you're born, before you're conceived, then the fact that he allowed you to be conceived means that he is effectively determined where you're going to spend eternity. And I'm thinking to myself, and I know this guy doesn't like the concept of predestination. I'm thinking, buddy, you just painted yourself into a corner you can't get out of. I think that through logically. And then he said, and I couldn't believe it. He says, so therefore God does not know who's going to be saved. And I thought, you've got to be joking. He denies God's omniscience because he doesn't like the concept of the ultimate reality that if God actually knows where you're going to spend eternity before you're born or conceived, predestination has to be true. And so he stood and he openly denied God's omniscient knowledge. I'm thinking you, and you know, it's, that's one of the great temptations when you're reading scripture and you run across something that you've troubled with and you're not quite sure what to do with. Great temptation is to twist scripture so it fits you. May I suggest to you, <laughs> that's a very bad idea. God gives us scripture so it can untwist us, mm -hmm. not so we can twist it. And so, I don't think it's a good idea to deny God's omniscience because I'm uncomfortable with his sovereign choice in salvation. God does not forbid the unbelieving soul to come. I mentioned that in the call, the first two sources of that call, the universal call and that common call that goes out, each of those are an open invitation to anyone who will repent from sin. But the truth of the matter is, no one ever does repent from sin because of those two calls. The just God has laid the invitation out there, but no human being will respond to that because of what's going on inside of us. What's going on inside of us is open rebellion against God until God intervenes. And as an act of the creator, calls you by name. And your salvation is because God called you by an act of his sovereign will. That's what he's telling us. Our salvation is the work of almighty God. And therefore it is good. It is good in the sense that it is perfect and without blemish and without flaw. God is omnipotent, all-powerful, and therefore your salvation is eternal. And no one can pluck his sheep out of his hand. And my frailty and your frailty is no match for his power to keep you. He purchased you and called you, but the purchase price was his own blood. And there is no way that he shed that blood for you without effect. The price was paid for you. And the master, the great shepherd, defines himself as a good shepherd because he can keep us. And therefore, my salvation does not depend on my frail grip of God. My salvation depends on the almighty grip of God, on me, who watches over me, who call me by name, specifically that he may do his work in me.
when we pray for God to save those that we love, we can know that that same power to do for them is the power of what someone prayed for him to do for us. It is not limited by the schemes of the devil, nor is it limited by the stubbornness of the lost. You ever witness to the stubborn? It can be frustrating. You'll find that at times, it doesn't matter what you could say. You, as the old saying goes, you could stand on your head and spit nickels. And what you say and do may seem to have no effect on them, but when you are calling on Almighty God to do for them what he has done for you, their stubbornness is no match for the hound of heaven, the Holy Spirit. And so it is not a limitation on your prayer life. It is an open invitation to pray and to bring their name before the throne of grace and power. For God says that he is able to do more than you can even begin to imagine in their life. Say, so, well, what about human free will? Well, human free will is a part of being created in the image of God. You were created with free will, but the problem was that was broken in Eden. Just like everything else about the image of God in us. It was broken. And Jesus said, if any man is, uh, the Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will be free indeed. When you are in Christ, you are set free, and the shackle that shackled you to Satan and to death and to hell was broken. And you were recreated back into the image of Almighty God, and in doing so, he gave you freedom. And therefore, the Bible says that we are now free indeed. We are free to walk away from our sin and to walk toward Christ. God's free will, or our, our free will and God's sovereign choice can be likened to two sides of one coin. Now, I said early on that there's a part of this that I can't understand, and I can't. Um, years ago, I listened, I wasn't there when this guy was being questioned, but he was being questioned for ordination. And uh, when you're being questioned for ordination in many groups, uh, pretty much they can ask you anything they want. They can ask you about your personal life. They can ask you about your knowledge of the Bible. They can ask you about your Christian experience and all these things. And one of the fellows there, and you're, what's going on is they've got this guy sitting in a chair and he's sitting in front of like, 50 pastors that are just asking question after question. You talk about oral exam. Have you ever been nervous over an oral exam? You should see the look on the face of these young guys who are candidates for ministry. And one of the guys asked him, he says, how is it? Can you explain to me how it is that there is a legitimate free human will? And yet, Almighty God is sovereign in his predestination of all things. How would you answer that? Well, the young fellow, when the guy says, can you explain it? His answer was, no, sir, I can't, but I will gladly listen while you do. Well, folks kind of chuckled a little bit. They laughed a little bit. But then he had to come up with an answer because it was his turn. And he said, honestly, he said, I can't fathom how free will and the sovereign choice of God can both be absolutely true. But I believe because Scripture says they are, I believe they are. And he said, the only way I can explain that is that human free will, if you were standing in the middle of a train track, on one side you have a rail, on the other side you have a rail. 
They never cross each other. But somehow, if you look far enough down the track, they come together as one. And I've never heard a better explanation of that. You see, if God in the verse prior to this actually is able to cause all things to work together for good to them that love God, then God has to have the ability to bring it to pass by his sovereign will. And he does. How does he do it? I don't quite understand it. But I've come to understand that when the Bible tells me things I can't fathom, I learn to accept those things and to trust God that in time, partly here, but ultimately there, I will understand this stuff. But my point to you today is God put this here for you. Because you know what? There are times when you're going to need to know that your salvation doesn't depend on you. Your eternal security depends on God and his promise that he said he can keep and he will keep it because he really does have control over all things. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, this is a difficult subject for us to understand, to comprehend. But I ask you, God, to help us. Help us right where we are. And Lord, many of us have struggled with this for years. Yet, God, you continually unfold your revelation to us. And I pray for each one of us, Lord, that you would do just that. Help us, God, to understand it. Help us not to try to redefine it. Help us, God, to trust you for what we don't understand and to look forward to the day when we will. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. That wasn't me. <laughs> I stand with us, if you will. Are we going to get there this morning? There it is. All right, let's stand together and close with crown him with many crowns.